Human beings are pretty much like mold on cheese. Before long, we're going to have to buy another planet. We consume more resources globally than the planet can replenish. And further, we waste a lot of those resources. And the worst offender is the building industry. And the building industry is predicated on vast networks of very complex symbol systems. And in those symbol systems are embedded mindsets, which become algorithms for action, for our preferences. And cultural algorithms are good. You know, we, we have some that their propriety and, and civility. For instance, I notice you're all sitting one person to a chair. You could have doubled up. You could have said, you know, your lap looks a little bit more comfortable than these chairs. Do you mind if I sit in your lap this afternoon? Nobody did that. But there are insidious mindsets that go along in the building industry. There are, uh, one is the way it's done. And, and houses from the building industry are conspicuously geometric. Right? This and this. Oh, wait, let's be creative. This and this. We don't even have to get flat river rocks anymore. We can get perfectly square stones this thick. Whoa! We, have, we can do a perfect grid pattern. Yahoo! Oh, wait, let's be creative. Let's go diagonal. Yahoo! But that's when you hit a brick wall. Now, I build out of salvage material and recycled materials. So right away, we have the complexity of all those symbol systems, electrical uh, schematics and engineering calculations and architectural rendings, colliding with the elegance and simplicity of building with whatever you have. Just taking this pile of stuff, scraping off the mold and going, hmm, maybe we can build a house. So I have some pictures of some houses. I'll talk about those. And then I'll let them scroll behind me, and I'll talk about how I do what I do. I use the principles of art and design to put these materials together. Uh, if I just throw them together, you have a slummy admixture, and so nobody's happy. And so I'll talk about that a little bit more. I, uh, I love storybook architecture, and I always wanted to build a house that looked like a shoe. And a friend of mine said, well, Dan, <laughs> This is Texas. Why don't you build a cowboy boot? <laughs> so, built a cowboy boot. There it is. Then there it is from the air. Uh, we've got a little deck up there in the top of the boot. And uh, then when you have a staircase that goes up, it's an opportunity for curiosity and suspense. And it's dramatic. Um, and then gestalt psychology emphasizes recognition of pattern over parts that comprise a pattern. That is, repetition creates pattern. So you notice the floor is granite. So I get all, I get great quantities of granite. And so you just put that down in organic patterns. Then you notice uh, uh, going down is dramatic as well. And you notice the wall covering is derelict corrugated roofing. And we feel those textures. We feel them. Uh, this is a bedroom here. I lucked into uh, some gymnasium flooring. And so that became paneling on the wall. And of course, repetition creates pattern. And on the ceiling are vinyl record covers. We've got uh, a record cover there from the Beatles up there. Um, then this is the kitchen. We see all the corrugated roofing up there. And we feel that. We don't intervene with our symbol systems. We feel it. Then when I was pondering what I would use for door handles and drawer pulls, I had broken my belt the day before, and it was laying there on the counter, and I thought, hey, let's, let's try this. So uh, I, that third one down is my, my belt buckle, 
And I put the word out. Uh, anybody have a belt buckle that is, or belts that are, you're going to throw away? Oh, here they came. So we have belt buckles as handles and drawer handles, drawer bolts. Then I used uh, hood ornaments as, drawer, as door handles. And then if you have a cowboy boot, you ought to go ahead and have a cowboy hat. So that's my beautiful wife there on the front porch. And we have a deck up there on the top. Uh, there is the uh, staircase going up. Again, it gives a, a nice quality of suspense. And uh, it's made out of a tree uh, known as Bodark down there. And it outperforms any wood in the United States. But the reason it's not exploited commercially is it grows like this, most undisciplined tree you've ever seen. So we have this very organic quality here. Then there's a bedroom. Uh, we, instead of uh, sheetrock, drywall, uh, or wallpaper, we covered the walls with highway maps. And then the other bedroom, we covered it with uh, highway signs. So if you live in this house, there's no reason for you to get lost. <laughs> so I'll let these scroll behind me as I talk a little bit. Uh, David Abram uh, wrote a book titled The Spell of the Sensuous in which he made a remark that our environmental problems began thousands of years ago when we made the jump to literate culture. Before then, if I wanted to refer to the color red, I'd hold up a cherry or a rose or prick my finger. In a literate culture, we have the word red, which abstracts that quality common to all three, but not specific to any one. That is, we've abstracted ourselves this much from the natural world, this much from that system of checks and balances that the natural world provides. There isn't such a thing as 9.42 a.m. in the natural world. There isn't such a thing as a weed in the natural world. Those are human concepts. Fast forward 5,000 years, we love language. We tweet and chat and blab and text. We love it. And we need the utility of language. We need our symbol systems. So if I want to communicate, I'm going down to the corner store to get a loaf of bread and some butter, and I'll be back in 10 minutes if I can get my truck started, I need the utility of language for that. But language will never be able to say this. Ever, not in a million years. Language will never be able to say what Paco Bell's canon in D major delivers or Michelangelo's Pieta, ever. We need our language, but every word, every sound bite, every sentence carries with it cultural baggage. More viruses infect our language than ever threatened our computers, and they manifest themselves as mindsets, as cultural mindsets or algorithms for action. And these mindsets, some of them are insidious. Um, Christians are good guys, Muslims are bad guys, or vice versa. Republicans have silver bullets. Democrats just have bows and arrows, or vice versa. But in the words of a Rice University professor, she said, the planet doesn't care what our issues are. A tsunami will annihilate Christians and Muslims, Democrats and Republicans, with equal dispatch. So it devolves upon us to find out who we really are. And the only vaccine and antidote I know of to uncover some of these insidious mindsets is phenomenology, which is a branch of philosophy that studies who we really are in a world that really is completely sanitized of cultural overlay and personal bias. And we don't really completely sanitize ourselves, but that's the quest. So the easiest way to understand phenomenology is to close your eyes and touch your nose. In fact, close your eyes right now and touch your nose. Did anybody miss? No. You trusted those instincts, and they're the same instincts and sensibilities that our savage ancestors had thousands of years ago. They're still there. If I asked you, which is heavier, 
ding or dong, dark brown or powder blue, the space in the cellar or the space in the attic. Since none of those things have any mass, how is it that you'd answer dong, dark brown, and cellar? It's our sense of gravity that informs our sense of color, shape, balance, scale, texture, and so forth. Then every event in the world has a signature rhythm. Every kinetic event, every visual event, every cloudscape has a different rhythm than a treescape, which is different than downtown traffic at five o'clock. We feel those rhythms. You recognize that. Now I'm gonna give you the same information without the rhythm. Mm -hmm. Flattens that out. Every teacher recognizes the rhythm and dynamic of a shouting match that's going to lead to a fist fight even though it's around the corner in the hallway. Whoop, gotta go. Something's going on around here. If I asked you, would you rather scrape your knee on a satin sheet or on asphalt? You don't have to get the manual on knee scraping out and go, hmm, ha ha, satin sheet. Whoa, asphalt. We feel those things immediately. Those are the principles of art and design. It's not just some recipe some guy cooked up. Those are basic human cravings. And they impact the food we eat, the clothing we wear. Men are compelled to wear this ridiculous clothing. Somehow seeing buttons uh, offends everybody. Or a tie. So later on tonight, go off by yourself. Close your eyes and touch your nose and revel in your humanity. That might be a good time to start an inner cinema, an inner movie, whereby you personally save the world because you alone had the nerve to trust those deeper sensibilities and instincts, scrape away the mold and use the cheese and not let that mudslide of advertising and marketing dictate your lives. And of course, at the end of the movie, take a bow. After all, <laughs> you've just saved the world. And there'll be insane applause.